have our guests with us already been mentioned. If you are a guest here, never had the opportunity to, normally our pastor and his wife would meet you in the uh, resource office, but you're stuck with uh, my girlfriend and I today in their stead, but we would love to meet you, have a gift for you, have a cup of coffee and a cookie or something like that, but just greet you and thank you and tell you how very special you have made our service by coming and sharing them with us. Uh, we, uh, I, I, I was commenting to someone this week, we were at a place and some unfolding things happened and I, I told him, I said, you know, you have to believe sometime that God has a sense of humor. And I thought of that this morning as I was praying and trying to get my mind ready. I'm pastor would normally be at, at this point in the service and I, uh, I, I thought back 20 something years ago when I was the pastor and he came on as the assistant pastor. And there were times that I had to be gone and he would fill in. And I knew that the ministry you receive would be adequate, but I knew it would be second best. And I thought this morning, I thought, God, you know how to bring things full circle. At the risk of sounding arrogant, the ministry you receive today will be adequate, but it will be second best. I am so incredibly impacted by our pastor's ministry and the direction he's taking us and the principles that he's pouring into us. It, it, you just, I don't know about you, I don't want to miss a service. When I'm gone, I can't hardly stand it because I just don't know what he may come up with that service. That, but I am, I am definitely growing in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ as a result of our pastor's ministry. If you have your Bibles this morning, I do, and I will hurry every chance I get, uh, but I don't know if you're that big a hurry to go out there and crawl into cars, it's going to be 125 plus inside, but uh, if you are, well, I will hurry and let you do that. If you have your Bibles this morning, it is still morning, barely, Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Romans chapter 3, verse 19. I, I shouldn't, I think it's a carnal failing, but when the Lord drops something in my heart, I, I, I wrestle with God because I try to figure out, now who, who could this be for? And uh, so I, I, a long time ago I realized I, I, how many times I have walked to the pulpit with a message and I've argued all the way to the pulpit with God saying, God, this, this is fruitless. I know these people. I've pastored them for years. This is not, but you told me so I will and I begin preaching and in just a few minutes looking out across the congregation I see facial expressions and things emanating to the surface and I think, mm -hmm, I sure didn't know that was in this church. And so if the Lord will help me, I want to preach to you for a little while tonight. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. The purpose of the word, the purpose of the preaching of the word, is to bring about a revelation of sin. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. Wish we had a mirror, but just pretend there's one in front of you and say, that's me. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the, the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. If the Lord will help me for a little while this morning, I want to preach to you on the greatest impediment to grace. 
Everybody say praise the Lord. Bless you. You may be seated. The ultimate in the life of every person in this building this morning should be to be saved. Now I know we want to have good careers and, and that's fine. And we want to provide the best housing for our family that we're capable of and that's fine. And we want to drive the best car that we can afford and that's fine. And all of these things that have to do with the carnal human side of us. We have goals, we have ambitions, those are not bad. If you are a father here today, it ought to be important to you that you take good care of your family. And by taking good care, it doesn't mean that your kids wear brand name clothes. In fact, the only difference I've ever been able to determine between brand name clothes and Walmart clothes is brand name clothes have the label sewn on the outside. Hello? And so, if you can do that, that's fine. But, but just to be able to dress them in decent clothing, a decent place to lay their head at night, decent food. They don't always need filet mignon. They may never eat a filet mignon. But, but those are good ambitions to be an honorable citizen. But the ultimate goal of any one of our lives should be heaven, for lack of a better word. Now, many will never realize and understand that should be their ultimate goal, and so they go their way unknowing and, and uncaring seemingly, and, and they spend their lives futilely pursuing something that they're going to have to leave behind and let other people fuss over if they have any, any, any accumulation at all. Some realize that that should be their ultimate goal, but but they lack understanding of how it's achieved, and so they come to the end of life having missed out on it. And, and the, the, the sad thing is, <clears throat> none of it is, is God's doing. God, the Bible says in Peter, in, in Peter that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. John said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, Isaiah said that the Lord's arm is not short that it can't save. His ear is not heavy that it can't hear. Matthew, Jesus said, Come unto me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll, I'll give you rest. And so God's entire existence is purposed on bringing us to a saving knowledge of Him that we might give Him glory. And yet, and yet still so many miss out. Some are seemingly oblivious to the things of God, to the purposes of God, to the will of God. Some don't understand. Even, even here, some of us that, that are Christians, if you will, have spent a generation here in church. And, and, and even here, we, we still have the concept somehow that if we get from here to heaven, it's going to be the product of, of our doing and, and our performance. And the tragedy is that so many people don't understand that God operates on a value system that is diametrically opposite to that of man. Man, we are a people who are captivated by this concept of, of fairness. We want life to be fair. We want people to be fair. We want the society to be fair. And, 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 and because of this, this pursuit of fairness, we, we get the idea that that, that if we can just be good enough and work hard enough and, and be holy enough and, and, and earn it, that, that God will let us go to heaven. In Titus 3 and verse number 5, the writer lets us know it has nothing to do with fairness, but it is by his mercy that God saves us. There's a profound difference between God's value system and man's value system. If you were today to be unfortunate enough to be hailed into the courtroom of man and you came before a judge and a jury and, and you were charged with some unspeakable offense, you would be there and you would have only one hope of going free. And that would be to somehow, through a, through a clever attorney or through an earnest appeal or somehow a, a presentation of the facts and the, the evidence, to, to convince the court that you were innocent. And if you could not do that, then a severe penalty would be exacted of you. 
But in the courtroom of grace, the only way you can go free is to be guilty. Because grace doesn't work on the innocent. It only works on the guilty. And that is the reason that so many people seemingly cannot come to a saving relationship with God and they fail of the grace of God because somehow they've never developed the ability to come to grips with what they are. Their, their concept, even when they, when they come to, to an altar is seeking salvation, but their, their appeal is, I'm, a, I'm not a bad person. In fact, I'm a, I'm a good person and I, I didn't do anything all that badly. And I, but, but the problem is there's none good but one. And that's God. And so when we try to bargain our way into heaven and convince God that we're not a bad person, Galatians 2.21 said what all we do is, is we frustrate the grace of God because righteousness can't come by, by obeying rules. And the fact of the matter is Jesus didn't come to save the righteous he came in Luke 19 to seek and to save that which was lost. And so the only hope I have of being saved is somehow coming to grips with the fact that I'm lost. I'm a sinner. I need God. You say, well, brother, point to my sin. I will point to your sin in simply saying you've never been born again. Paul said, that is in my flesh. There's no good thing. The only good part about me is the Holy Ghost that is in me. And so here we come, and the purpose of preaching the Word of God is to bring about a revelation of sin. That's what our text said, Romans 7 and 7. said, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. The only way I know what's right or wrong is some preacher preaches the Word of God to me. That's why Romans 5, 20, Paul said, but moreover the law entered that offense may abound. The reason that we preach the Word of God is to make sin abound. And, and before you, you, you misunderstand it, that does not mean to be lots and lots of it. The word that's translated abound there is a Greek word which means to be heavy or to be a very deep and, and burdensome load. He said the, person, the purpose of preaching the Word of God is to bring about a revelation of who you are and what you are and make the sin that's in your life be a heavy load that you don't want to carry anymore. But he said, where sin is heavy, where sin doth abound, when, when the weight of sin, when the preaching of the word of God brings conviction and condemnation, and I apologize, but sometimes the word of God is going to bring conviction. It's going to bring condemnation. You say, well, I go to church to feel good. I understand that. But sometimes before you can feel good, you've got to feel bad. And when the preaching of the word of God brings about conviction and condemnation and makes you feel ugly and dirty and, un and unlovable, it's because you are dirty and ugly and unlovable. But Jesus said, bring that to me. And if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away and all things become new. Because when sin becomes heavy, when sin becomes a burden, I don't want to carry it anymore. Then then grace becomes much weightier. But only then. In Acts chapter 2, verse 36, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost has been poured out. The church has been birthed. They've been born again. The city of Jerusalem is noised about. It spills out into the streets. And they come and they question Peter and the apostles, what meaneth this? These men are acting crazy. You think we act silly around here? You should have been there on the day of Pentecost. The whole city thought they were drunk. And Peter said, well, as a matter of fact, they are. They're not drunk like you suppose because this is just the third hour. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. They haven't had a good, enough time to work up a good buzz. But they are drunk. They're drunk on the grace of God. They're drunk on the Holy Ghost. They're drunk on the joy of the Lord. They're... And then he shifted gears and he started not talking about those that had been redeemed. He talked talk to those that were there in the congregation that hadn't been redeemed and, and he began naming sins and he began pointing very pre uh, preaching very pointedly and the, verse 36 he said therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ and when they heard this they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles men and brethren what shall we do now these were the children of Abraham they were Abraham's seed 
They were, they were in the promised land. They were the, the, the people of God by race. But they heard the preaching of the word and it revealed their sin and they were pricked in their heart and they understood they were guilty. They felt their guilt. And you know the neat thing? They accepted their guilt. And it opened the door to the birth of the church and 3,000 people were added to the church in that day. And it's, it, I understand guilt is a very heavy, horrible, unpleasant thing. But you don't get rid of guilt by changing your conduct. You get rid of guilt by being pronounced innocent. And the only way you become innocent is to be born again. In 1 Corinthians 6 and 9, Paul said, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Can I read that for you again? The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he gets, he said, If you don't understand what I'm talking about, I'll get very pointed here. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Do I leave anybody out? And here's the thing. He said, what you better understand is such were some of you. If you're here today and you're not acclimated with Pentecost and you look around and you think most of these people, we've been in this all our life and we're just Mr. and Mrs. Goody two shoes and, and everything. Let me tell you something. Sitting next down, down the aisle from you as a former adulterer. Sitting down the aisle from you as a thief. Sitting down the aisle from you as, is, is, is a... Is, a drug addict sitting down as an alcoholic sitting but 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 he get on to say and such were some of you but you're justified in the name of the lord thank god i'm not what i'm going to be but thank god i am not what i was you look around this place every person you see is a sinner that was saved by the grace of God. But even then, we have to understand some people are deceived because they, they believe that once you get the Holy Ghost, that's a done deal. But let me tell you something. The infilling of the Holy Ghost is more than a moment of, of time. Salvation is not a destination. It is a journey. Romans, Paul said, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Hallelujah. The, the, the king, Saul, he was anointed the king of Israel. The oil of anointing was poured over him, which was a type of the Holy Ghost. But there came a day that the word of the Lord came to him with commandments and instructions, and he disobeyed. And, and when he was confronted by the preacher, if you will, and the word of the Lord came, he said, why did you do this? And he started trying to pass the buck. He said, well, well, the people caused me, and it was this and it was that. Let me tell you something. I don't care how good you are, how long you've had the Holy Ghost, you will never fully escape the clutches of your flesh. And you're going to stub your toe every once in a while, and you're going to transgress. You do, and you will. I do, and I will. I'm not proud of it. And when I do, invariably a preacher will step in the pulpit, and when he gets to preaching, guilt will start eating me alive. But Saul, didn't re he refused to accept the guilt. He said, I'm a good king. I'm a good man. I led him. We won a great battle. I'm a cool dude. And God rejected him. A few years later, the king that followed him committed adultery, had that, husband's, that woman's husband murdered so that he could take her as his wife. And a preacher came to him, and he said, you're the man. And perhaps the greatest king Israel ever knew said, oh, God, I'm guilty. What do I do? How do I? And one continued to be king and led Israel to greatness. And the only difference was one of them realized that in the courtroom of God, grace only works on the guilty. Galatians 3, 24. Paul said, for the law was our schoolmaster 
to bring us to Christ. The Word of God, he says, is our schoolmaster. It's a, it comes from a Greek word. It, it talks about the servant that was responsible to get the kids to class. You see, that's what the, the preaching of the Word does. It, 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 gets us, it gets us our thinking right, and it, it brings us to class. You say, well, what class? Well, it's the class that Titus talked about when he said, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we live whole, soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's the class that the preaching of the Word of God gets us to. And so we have to have a preacher. We must have it. It pleased God to choose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. But the way it saves us is it brings us to a place of understanding our guilt. And if we're honest enough to be able to plead guilty, the grace of God can step into the jury box. And whatever the world might have proclaimed about your, your sentence, the grace of God says, everything's cool, you're free. You can go. Preaching brings revelation of sin. Only then do we understand that I will not be saved because of my merit. I will not be saved because I measure up. I will never be good enough. I don't get good to get God. I get God to get good. Does that mean I don't have to obey the word of the Lord? No, sir, that is not what that means. But simply obedience is not enough. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, husbands love your wife, that's the part, but hear this, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present himself a glorious church having not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing that it should be holy and without blemish and and I know sometimes we we, we look around at this thing that's called the church and we we think well we got a long way to go we're not there yet but you don't understand you got to get in the jury box and look from where grace is looking I got a perfect wife. She's an incredible lady. I tell her every day, she makes me happy. You might look at her and say, well, she's a nice lady, but perfect. No, but you don't understand. She's not trying to please you. She's trying to please me. <laughs> and when she pleases me, she's perfect. And you may look at this thing called the church and say, boy, I, I sure don't think that thing is perfect, but we're not doing this to please you. We're doing this to please him. And when this thing gets just like he wants it, he's going to say that's perfect. Amen. Our problem, with Romans 3, 24, Paul said being freely justified by grace. We, through grace, we're free. Through grace, we're justified. Our problem is sometimes we want to bargain with God. Well, God, I'll do this and this and this if you'll say. We don't have any bargaining power. And it's sad some of us don't understand that. We say, well, God, if you'll save me, I'll do this and this and this and this. He'd look at you and say, I've already got people doing that for me. I don't need you to do that for me. I need you to need me. I need you to be guilty. I need you, I need you to let my grace work on you. If all I need is somebody to dress a certain way, I got people already doing that. If all... And I'm not saying we don't have to obey the rules. But we want to bargain with God. And some of us have never understood what, what God said in 2 Chronicles, Chronicles 7 and 14. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, humble themselves, and pray, and turn from their wicked ways, and seek my face, I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I'll heal their land. But the first thing you've got to do is humble yourself. comes from the Hebrew word to humiliate. That's the reason a lot of people are never going to be saved. They have too stinking much pride. They're... Do you understand that all of the evil we deal with in the world today is the product of nothing but pride? The devil was an angel. He was the elite. God had never created anything as beautiful as him. And the problem is he started believing his own press clippings. And the Bible says his heart was lifted up. He became proud of himself. It was nothing more or less than pride that turned an angel into a devil. And yet somehow we think 
the grace of God is going to accept our pride. Let me tell you something. I don't care who you are today. You have absolutely nothing to be proud of except the fact that God loves you. But you don't understand all the good I've done. I don't care about all the good, and neither does God. Oh, no. Philippians 2 and 9 and 10 says, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, given him a name that's above every name. Let it the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow. Of things in earth, heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and every tongue's going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, that's the sad thing. Every, every one of us here today we're eventually going to humiliate ourselves. Every knee is going to bow. And every tongue is going to confess. It's all a matter of timing. That's just like over, over my many years of ministry, I've, I've had people come to the church, love the spirit, love the fellowship, love the kindness, love the love that they feel, come to an altar, repent of their sins, baptize in Jesus' name, get the Holy Ghost. And they think it's a done deal then, and all of a sudden, one day I step in the pulpit and I say, oh, by the way, there's a couple of thou shalt nots in the Bible. And I've actually had people come to me and say, Brother Mons, I love you. I love the church. This is wonderful. But I guess we're going to have to go somewhere else because I just can't give that up. And I have never, somebody wiser than I is going to have to help me understand and, and show me one thing that a person's going to have to give up to go to heaven that they're not going to give up to go to hell. It's just a matter of timing. Give it up now and go to heaven, or give it up later and go to hell. But every knee's going to bow. Every tongue's going to confess. People that have the ability to be guilty are a blessed people. As a minister, we preach, reprove, rebuke, exhort, discipline, collectively and individually. Sometimes it's hard work. Let me talk to you parents for just a minute, okay? You better learn how, and you better be willing to work with your pastor where your children are concerned. Because there are going to be seasons. I don't care how good your kid is. I don't care if he's the star athlete on the team, the star of the senior drama, the queen of homecoming, California Scholarship Federation, won a full ride at Yale or Harvard or whatever. I don't care how good they are. They are flesh and they're going to make mistakes. And sometimes pastors going to have to deal with those mistakes. And if you're more interested in your, in your young man or young lady sliding through the gates of heaven than sliding into home plate with a winning rung and, and your ultimate is to see them saved, you better allow them to be guilty. Because grace only works on the guilty. The problem is, we want everything fair. And you nailed my kid, and I know that so-and-so's kid did the same thing, and they got away with it. Boy, I am preaching now, huh? Let me let you in on a secret. Can I share the word of the Lord with you? Hebrews 2, 2, for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience receives a just recompense or reward, there's nobody that gets away with anything. God may not let you sit in the grandstands and watch when he gives them their comeuppance, but you're concerned for your children. You, you better be more concerned about them leaving the courtroom of grace free than defending them in something that is wrong. That wasn't in my notes. So that was... Galatians 2 and 8, for by grace are we saved. Ephesians 2 and 8, I'm sorry. By grace are we saved. I gave him the wrong scripture. By grace. And that not of ourselves, the gift of God. See, here's the thing. Matthew 7, 22. At judgment, Jesus said, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, in thy name cast out devils, in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. How, how could you not know that? Because we don't come acquainted with God because of our works. We come to be acquainted with God because of our revelation of Him and our relationship with Him. Let me 
drive this home. You cannot earn heaven. Now here's the frightening thing though. You can earn hell. The wages of sin is death. You've got to earn hell. You've got to work for it. But eternal life is the gift of God. The remedy is not all that difficult. 2 Corinthians 10 and 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Paul admonishes us, 14, 12 of Romans, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. But what, what, what about others? It doesn't matter about others. Well, what about it doesn't matter about them? The most critical point in the determining of, of anybody's eternal destiny is at that moment that they, they stand in court and the word of the Lord confronts them and they are confronted with the fact that I don't care how good you are, I don't care how honorable you are, the Bible says without the grace of God you are a sinner. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen preached even in the city of Jerusalem and he pointed out the fact that they were betrayers and they were murderers. And the Bible said his words cut them to their heart. And they were confronted with an incredible choice. They could either plead guilty or they could fight the charge. And the Bible says they gnashed on him with their teeth. That still happens to preachers. Oh, not physically, but emotionally, verbally. In Acts chapter 2, Peter preached to the same city. And he said, with wicked hands, you have crucified the Lord of glory. The difference was that congregation pled guilty. And 3,000 souls were added to the church that day. Musicians, come quickly, please. Isaiah 64 and 6, the prophet said, our righteousness is as filthy rags to God. Now, please understand, the difference in our righteousness and His is not my conduct, it's not the rules, it's not my lifestyle, the difference is my motive. Our righteousness is an attempt to convince God that we've earned salvation, to sway the jury, to overlook our guilt. Our righteousness is purposed only to be saved. His righteousness is what we offer Him because He has saved us. Righteousness is not optional. But righteousness is not something I perform to be saved. It's something I give to God. It's the homage that He asks of me because He has saved me. do the very best I can Laquita to take care of you to honor you to care for you to be there for you but I don't do that to try to win your love I, w I do that to thank you for your love and that's the role that righteousness is supposed to play Brother Tim, we don't do it to win salvation. We do it as a gift to God because He has saved us. And so here we stand. The court's in session. We stand at the bench and the judge is asking, how do you plead? Others have stood there in other generations gone by. He said, Adam, how do you plead? And Adam said, it wasn't my fault. It was the woman you gave me. He said, Aaron, how do you plead? He said, well, it was an accident. We just threw the gold in the fire and it came out of calf. Saul, how do you plead? Well, it wasn't me. It was the people. All of them pled not guilty. And all of them were lost. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 10 and 2, for we dare not make ourselves of the number 
or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. If I was not guilty, what in the world, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, calls Jesus, for he said, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that through his poverty. Why, if I could be innocent without the grace of God, why in the world would he ungod himself and come to earth and robe himself in flesh and die a sin? The fact is, Isaiah 53, 6 says, For all we like sheep have gone astray. We turned every way to his own way, but the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then, to me, one of the most profound verses of Scripture in the entire Bible, 130 Psalms, verse 3. If the Lord should mark iniquity, the word mark there is a Hebrew word which means to make something permanent and irrevocable. But Jim, if God had made our iniquity permanent, where would we stand? I have rehearsed this before, I don't know when, but I just feel to say it. Many, many, many years ago, one of the elders of our church was an old preacher named Jess Clayton. You know, Dusty, I think it was your great grandpa. And I was in service the last time he preached. It was a Sunday night before he had a terminal stroke the next Saturday. And during his preaching, he he brought this whole sermon into one little paragraph. He said, last night I dreamed that I died and I went to judgment. He said, I got in line as far as the eye could see people and way up the other line, this incredible glow and I knew that was the white throne of God. And he said, I couldn't wait for my turn to stand before him and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. And he said, it seemed like it took forever. But said, finally, I stood before the king. Said he never said a word. Said he just pointed over to a huge set of balances that were off to the side, indicated that I should step on. And said, with, with a heart so ecstatic, I'm about to get my reward. He said, I stepped up on the balance and said, in just a second of time, my, my glee turned to horror because he realized that he said, I wasn't measuring up. And said, in an instant of time, I relived my whole life. I thought of day after day and week after, what did I do? What didn't I do? What did I leave undone? What more could I? And Brother Mike, he said, I could not think of a thing and said despair just began to wash over me like waves of water until all of a sudden he said I felt the balances jerk and they came into balance and he said I looked over and Jesus had stepped up beside me The grace of God that brings salvation to all men that are saved is in this place today. The problem is it doesn't work on the innocent. It only works on the guilty. So every one of us, we're standing before the judge today and he's waiting for our plea. How do you plead? I don't know about you. But I'm going to look at him today and say, Jesus, I plead the blood. <laughs> the altar's open if you want to come and talk to the Lord.